It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you in this joint webinar, uh, African Federation of Angiology and Vascular Surgery and International Union of Angiology, uh, predominantly targeting uh, our junior vascular fellows. And um, I do believe uh, in presence of top experts in the field, uh, this is going to be really a, a productive and fruitful um, event. Uh, let me quickly start by uh, thanking the um, SIGBARIS group for the logistic uh, support. We are having uh, just a, a stellar of uh, panelists and speakers today. Uh, I'll quickly introduce them. Uh, we are having Professor Pierluigi Antignani, past president of the IUA and currently the president of IUA Foundation. Uh, that's uh, the other wing of this joint webinar. And uh, we are having Professor Sergio Zanizini, a professor of vascular surgery at the University of Ferrara and currently the president uh, of uh, UIP, as well as uh, being the president of the uh, VUN Foundation. And uh, Professor Pedro Comlos is currently on a flight in, in Brazil, so he won't be able to join us. Uh, Professor Armando Mancilla from Porto, uh, Professor of uh, vascular, uh, Angiology and Vascular Surgery in, in, in Porto, Portugal, President-elect of uh, International Union of Angiology. And um, of course, Professor Eduardo Ramachotti, uh, last but not least, uh, professor of thrombosis and hemostasia at Loyola University, and uh, uh, he is the CBO and co-founder of the Science Valley Research Institute, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Hopefully, there isn't much rain right now. And uh, of course, my dear colleagues at Enchamps University, Professor Sharif Hassam, who is the scientific secretary of uh, African Federation of Angiology and Vascular Surgery, Professor Abdurrahman Salim. Uh, vascular surgery at Shams University and Professor Hanan Hamid, um, Professor of Clinical Hematology at Shams University. Welcome you all. And um, we'll start now by the presentation by Professor Giannizini, which will be followed by a comment through uh, three or four slides uh, sent already by uh, Professor Mancilla from Portugal. Questions from the uh, panelists or comments uh, from the audience to the panelists or any comments will be directed uh, through me as we proceed. Uh, Professor Giannizini, could you be start right now? Sure. Thank you so much, Professor Hussein, dear Ahmed, and all uh, the friends and colleagues from Africa and all around the world. Uh, this is a topic that apparently is uh, easy, the one you're giving, but in reality, if we really want to dissect it in a filterless and proactive way, you will see becomes quite challenging. I really like this joke that is saying that I suspect we'll find the coffin painter in the last one in honor of Egypt. So clearly education becomes very important, particularly in a discipline like phlebology. Conflicts of interest, I am involved with courses, the Venus Insufficiency Personal and Practicums, a spin-off of the university and as president of the UAP, I'm of course involved also with the educational modules. I also like to declare I'm not an expert in certification for which I might say something wrong and for this you will excuse me. But this presentation really wants to be an honest brainstorming on what I consider a very serious issue for which experts like us, societies like the ones we represent should really be involved. I also declare that I really don't like so much when I hear somebody saying I just do veins. I just do veins. Because if you just do veins, you mean that you just take care of clinical skills, ultrasound expertise, superficial deep and pelvic knowledge, lymphology expertise as well. You might have some good knowledge also of some basic surgery. Of course, you have to know all the devices, thermal, non-thermal, and all the new technologies. You might be, you might be good in um, sclerotherapy. You must be good in wound care. Compression, you must know it. You must know pharmacology. It's very important. You speak a lot with Professor Ramachati and the other experts in thrombosis because you also are involved with the thrombotic risk management. But it's also important you speak with other big colleagues, uh, experts in uh, aesthetic phlebology, because there is not just an aesthetic component. There is always also a therapeutic part behind that. And of course, you must be expert in uh, lifestyle so that you can suggest the best 
your patients for nutrition, occupation, and in sport conditions that might or not affect the veins. And then eventually you're also interested in academic work. So you must know the translational medicine and moving from the bench to the bedside. And then you must know also the hemodynamics and the biochemistry of the biosignaling on how physical forces are, are translated into biochemical messages inside our veins and potentially also the lymphatics. So when you're asking me about training a med, I wonder if you're asking me about the red or the blue pill of the matrix. Is, is it about just getting a certificate or you really want to have a training with a degree behind that? If uh, we honestly dissect the current scenario, this is uh, what I found uh, on the web and uh, in the knowledge I have of the different offers. Back in 2010, UAP already came out with a document clearly specifying the requirements uh, for a phrenology curriculum. And uh, interesting enough, four years later, uh, four colleagues uh, reported uh, again the requirements according to their perspective of the phlebology training. Some of these colleagues are involved now with the College of Phlebology, that is uh, the European, sorry, College of Phlebology, because indeed there might be also some confusion with the fact that there are different organizations with similar names. Now, the European College of Phlebology, which is, of course, a, a great uh, opportunity in terms of uh, education is uh, putting out the possibility of having a certification, as you see over here. And if we read about uh, this opportunity, we see that this is basically a congress of three days, plus uh, eventual online activities that are going to be available soon for what they are reporting. But it's also true that there is, as they are reporting, a specific industry sponsor sessions involvement. Uh, there are industry advisors involved in the board. So that, of course, there is a cost that we also have to consider that is right, that there is, because, of course, there is a, a service. But at the same time, we should really ask ourselves where the value is for this course. So on this, uh, there is the cost of the Congress plus the course uh, that I couldn't find uh, the value in reality in the Internet. Interestingly enough, they are also reporting that, that there is um, a lining up with the UMS, that is another European organization, the one of the medical specialties. So they are reporting a collaboration with the UMS that is considered the regulatory authority that is overseeing the certification process. Now, if you're talking about regulatory authority, and again, I won't just to be in a brainstorming phase with experts like you guys. A, a regulatory authority is a governmental agency that regulates business in the public interest. So before talking about regulatory authority, we should really be cautious, in my opinion. Maybe or maybe not. And then they're reporting that the highest standards uh, are present, but compared to what, I wonder? To, for example, a university program, a degree path that somebody can have. Of course, it's very important to have a certification of quality, but also to understand uh, what we are really talking about certification, degrees, things that we must have to practice something or not. Now, another group, a few years later, published in another journal, again, other requirements for uh, the curriculum of the phlebologist. And this is, again, the UMS that in the other website was a reported link to these other opportunities. So we have two overlapping opportunities that uh, I'm not totally clear about. And there is a multidisciplinary joint committee that uh, is uh, reported over there. And this is a, a good opportunity, of course, for education. You have two-year maximum training. You have also in-person experience. At the same time, the subjective requirements to become a trainer, as you can see over here, are not even including the need of having or not a residency done in some specific specialty. So basically, whoever could become an instructor if they are doing enough procedures to be uh, included in this. This is also a way to certify centers that become training centers that, uh, as I see from the list in Internet, in the majority of cases are private centers. So it's very important also to understand uh, the kind of collaboration we have with the institutions when we are doing uh, these kind of activity that are extremely, of course, productive and needed. But at the same time, we must be sure that uh, we are giving the proper name and surname to the certificates we want to give. I was checking out an Italian uh, society website that is still mentioning the opportunity of uh, these UMS uh, courses. But uh, when I went uh, in the UMS website, I could not find uh, the phlebology uh, sector act, um, active. So I don't know if this is uh, still there and I don't know honestly the cost. It might be my lack of knowledge, as I said at the beginning. 
So now let's fly all the way to US. If we go to US, there is an interesting opportunity provided by the American Board of Venous Lymphatic Medicine. Now, this is just a certification, as they are clearly stating, and that's very nice they are stating it. Basically, you take an exam to see if you fill in in the category of what they consider a certified phlebologist. This has a cost as well. The initial certification is 1,190 US dollars. Every two years, you have to recertify yourself for, for 425 US dollars. There is a society, as we can see from the website behind, a scientific society that is the American Basin and Lymphatic Society that might give you some training before the certification, if you like. And again, of course, there is a cost behind that you see over here, ranging from 950 and 1,350 US dollars. What they particularly appreciate by what they report in the website is that they make loud and clear that the board does not define who may or may not practice venous and lymphatic medicine. It is neither a source of censor nor an entity for the resolution of ethical or medical legal issues. And I think this is the most important slides that Madame is showing, because this is really defining what we need or what we don't need. Of course, it's good to have certificates on the wall, but we have to be sure we are using them in a proper way. Again, I remind you I'm biased because I'm involved uh, with the UAP. This is the UAP offer together with the, the Australasian College of Phlebology. These are online modules that are including also the possibility of an in-person uh, experience requiring uh, 44 weeks in this case. You might go up to four years. Again, there is a cost, $1,442. US I think uh, it is uh, plausible the fact uh, that we have tier two and tier three countries for free in case they want to get engaged in that sense. And in this case, again, I applaud uh, uh, the initiative uh, of reporting clearly that uh, this is not a higher education provider. So we are just giving a certificate. Now, moving to the Wind Foundation, we have 43,000 more people connected in uh, the network. And we see that um, the majority is actually in private practice. So this really means that uh, there is a need for proper training, but indeed must be proper. And also in BWIN, we are offering possibility of education with uh, 10 online modules on the different uh, fields of veins and lymphatics. We have two days of practice in the operating room every time with just 15 people coming and uh, experiencing things firsthand. But also in this case, even if it is a zero cost for the attendees, there is an industry involvement. And again, we clearly specify this is not a degree recognition, it's just education. So if you allow, Ahmed, I will change the, the topic in needs for proper training in phlebology and proper is uh, the key because if you read around you find also interesting papers reporting the many perils of accepting certification rather than real qualifications reminding everybody in this nice article uh, that uh, the certificate does not always uh, means uh, that uh, you will have success in terms of being hired or having more patients. Of course, uh, this is about knowledge and not about experience. The quality of certification is always hard to be assessed because you can have uh, high level courses or low level courses for which the real reliability of you as professional showcasing these certificates is uh, really variable as well. And of course, also a nice brainstorming on the fact that if it is quite too easy to get that certificate, also the value of that certificate is diluted because everybody can have it, of course. There are interesting uh, pages you know, that you can find on the web, like this one, on the hidden epidemic, how certification fraud undermines healthcare. So I suggest you to have a look at, at these topics when you choose which certificate you want. I also suggest not to use the name of the university for courses or uh, activities that are not really related to university, because this can lead to misinterpretation. And indeed, in India only, they found uh, 24 fake universities that are giving fake certificates. Let's not think this is um, a modern issue. If you go back to 1730, you will see that they were talking already about the fraudulent certificates as a common practice. And in this very interesting paper by Grullo, you see that recently the issue is attracting more attention. And indeed, even the, the high tech guys are helping us now with the technology called blockchain and smart contracts that are allowing to really identify valuable versus not valuable certifications. So in conclusion, who has the real degree awarding power? 
in phlebology and in lymphology because everybody can give certificates or receive certificates but in reality you go down to the universities that's uh, the the real degree power that we have that's why with the UAP I would strongly wanted uh, an academic and uh, institution working group together also with an advocacy one this is also a chance to deeply thank uh, you Amanda and also Professor Mansile and Professor Ramacciotti, who are involved in this activity together with giant figures, together with the, the great group uh, with Gordon Guyat. And this is a great honor for us because this is Gordon Guyat, is uh, the guy who invented the term evidence based and is the one who basically invented the grade one ABC that we all know. So it will be a pleasure to co work. Uh, with uh, these uh, colleagues and uh, with all the ones uh, who want, uh, because uh, the way I feel it is that there is a need of engaging more real institutions like the universities to co-work with our scientific societies. There are different PhDs and master's programs around the world that we can uh, put in visibility in front of our people, co-working with the courses we do with the societies, but at the same time working with the real uh, institutions uh, so that we have also identification of uh, really unbiased centers were practicing phlebology and lymphology, reaching out to the residents and also to the governments for proper recognition of phlebology and lymphology. Just a quick uh, ending uh, on the real situation, though, in uh, these academic centers. If I look, for example, at the Italian situation, this is the number of procedures of stripping or ablation done in the years. You see how it's dropping down in the public sector, in particular, then uh, in uh, the hospitals, in the academic centers. And you see that the majority of centers are doing less than 10, 10 vein procedures per year. Now, this means that the real expertise is not always inside uh, the academic setting or the hospitals, it's also in the private practice. So that's why it's so important to combine the two things. With the University of Ferrara, where I work, we have different international PhD programs that can be integrated with the different expertise of the scientific societies and of uh, the different private practices. And that's a call to action to do the same with the different universities so that uh, we can also brainstorm together if phlebology remains just a subspecialty or it's heading toward becoming a real specialty. I will conclude with this uh, important article, I think, from uh, the finance world. Varicose veins treatment devices market worth nearly 1 billion by 25. This means that in the last years, it basically doubled. They are even reporting that the lack of skilled professionals can hamper the growth. What I think is very important is this mini-invasive maxi concern. The more we become mini-invasive now with the devices that don't even touch the patients, the more we open the doors to not properly trained colleagues who are going to treat veins. That's why we have to stay united, I think, bringing true care as we did with the project of BWIN, also about the certification and regulatory aspects, reporting eventually uh, situations that are flowed in a, a filterless and moral way, as we have done also during uh, the 2022 document production published in 23 International Union of Angiology, with also booklets in every language for the patients, as we are doing with the uh, UAP with uh, documents dedicated uh, to appropriateness in the four different sectors you see reported over here, as we are doing reporting in a dedicated global registry will be win as we will present uh, this October in Indonesia, where of course you're all invited, including also the pre-Congress activity where there will be a lot of chances of doing training, but of course not getting degrees. This is just education for which I hope you will join us there, as I hope you will join us in the other initiatives we are running with the UAP. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. You brilliantly uh, have been dwelling into the, the core of the uh, um, needs uh, for training, for proper training in phlebology, as you uh, rightly uh, described it. Uh, allow me, uh, of course, I'm sure uh, there will be uh, a few comments, but allow me that to present in a timely fashion um, the reply to me by uh, Professor Mansila from uh, from Porto, which is nothing but a, a few uh, three or four slides that I will share with you on his behalf. They go in line with uh, what Sergio has been uh, saying for the last few minutes, but. Uh, the one million dollar question, I believe, and then I will involve uh, some of our brilliant discussants as well. 
is can we really standardize the uh, proper training of flebology? Uh, we are having the American model, and I might be biased, probably myself and Sarah, because both of us are alumni of the USUS uh, um, in Bethesda, but um, um, they have their own system, which is as, as elaborate as it is. We have different, probably different needs in Egypt and in the region. Europe uh, is in the front line, of course, and we have seen this model. But uh, let me put right away and share my screen with you um, for two minutes. Yes, Dr. Ahmed, uh, thank you uh, for uh, this invitation. Well, in, if you are talking about our situation in here in, in Egypt, uh, we are still uh, lacking um, um, such uh, Venus centers to be dedicated to Venus uh, work and uh, dedicated uh, ultrasonographers, for example. We, we are still uh, lost in the general uh, um, um, ultrasound centers or uh, radiology centers. Uh, every patient go and do, does his uh, scan in any center and then comes to you. And sometimes these scans are not as accurate as we expect. And sometimes when we do ultrasound by ourselves to verify, we found a lot of uh, problems and fallacies in the um, uh, these scans. So we are really uh, lacking a, a comprehensive or a, a totally dedicated Venus uh, center to serve this uh, the Venus, uh, the whole spectrum of the Venus problems, of course. As, as as Professor Giancini explained in the beginning, it's it's a whole spectrum of work. It's it's not just pains, as he said. For everybody who is interested in the proper training in flebology, there are three elements involved over here, like trainees, trainers, and the training program. So we are talking about theoretical knowledge, practical skills. This has been already mentioned by Sergio, and the professionalism. There has to be a schedule for training a duration, and uh, certain particular qualifications. What I'm sensing right now is that I'm, I'm just uh, summing up what Sergio has been so elaborate uh, uh, while giving his lecture. And there has been an assessment and evaluation modality uh, which fits within the, um, the, the same framework of the institutions uh, we are working in. Uh, be it in South Mediterranean, in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Europe, or in the U.S. Um, and uh, having that have, having been said, there has to be a process for recognition as a trainer. I cannot be a trainer unless I get a uh, sort of uh, preparation and uh, a certification which has to be probably renewed every like three or four uh, years. Uh, so this is sort of quality management for trainers themselves. And uh, in the end, uh, it's a, an integrated process that has to be taken into account. The healthcare system, the cohort of trainees, which have to be targeted, and uh, um, the modality that we're going to be using. Uh, can I invite uh, Pier Luigi to say a word over here? Pier Luigi, Pier Luigi is, uh, is there. I see his, his camera off. So if you want, uh, I can speak for Italy as well, Evan. Please do. Well, as I told you, in Italy, of course, uh, we have that uh, in the specialty program eventually. And that's, I think, also a nice example. You can have some extra months in, uh, in the, the residency program in vascular surgery in which you can focus more in phlebology, but this has basically no mandatory presence in your curriculum if you want to practice phlebology. So I think uh, the professor has some said it perfectly. We need to have uh, a proper recognition of uh, what a curriculum of phlebologists should look like. And that's, yeah, I would say, Sharif, because uh, also with the UAP, just this year, we came out with the updated version of the 2010, so that uh, what a rightfully placed phlebology should have in his curriculum is there. What is not there, in my opinion, is the recognition of the institution and this fish market of courses and of entities giving uh, 
something to stick to the wall just because maybe I'm in some foreign country and it makes fashionable to say, oh, Italian certificate or US certificate. But what does it really mean? And are we really moral when we are promoting this as experts or scientific bodies? Or are we just making, again, business behind that? So there is great educational opportunities around. As I mentioned, there are different formats with different contents. As Matt correctly said, there is a length that I think should be reached before talking about proper training. I don't think you could go less than three years before having, it you know, also depends if you're starting, for example, already from a major training in, I don't know, vascular or general, whatever it is. But at the same time, we have to recognize with institutional bodies that in my opinion are just universities, because that's the degree power that we have. A collaboration with the scientific societies and also the private practice, because I tell you my experience in my university. If I have to teach just in my university, I teach just one device because the hospital setting is allowing you to get just one device. And it's impossible. I mean, it's possible, but it's not like the best practice to have just one device in your armamentarium. So that's why with the UAP, and that's why I really want to thank Emad and uh, Eduardo to have joined this initiative uh, of the academic group, as there are like also other working group, including one of advocacy, because we can just talk at our back and not sing up in front about all these courses we have, or we can just put some lights in the dark corners and simply saying, okay, there is this situation, how we take these good parts and we make them really valuable rather than just a business oriented activity to do some education at the same time, some business. Uh, the, the homework uh, looks like huge. And uh, I have a sense that probably there will be uh, an interesting session uh, in the uh, VU Indonesia, probably for this important, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I know how you think, uh, Sergio, and um, thank you again for your time. And uh, if before Professor Giannizini leaves, uh, any questions or comments from uh, our discussions or from uh, the panel? Just a comment. Because the problem, uh, we as an international society or national European society, we organize a very good training program. But the problem is that they recognize this title by means of institution. And the institution is a university or a minister. And the university have the, sp the specific program of the trainer. And the integration of our <laughs> program with the program of university is a very big problem because it's difficult that the, the university change the program. Each university change the program, uh, follow the uh, input of uh, so, the biological society. It, I think it is uh, the big problem of our work. But we try to solve this problem. It's very, very difficult. I, I couldn't agree more with Pierre Luigi if you can just give a, a real life experience. I have many, many big surgeons, vascular surgeons who are doing major surgery, who then come just to learn how to poke a vein. Because in the major yeah. pro program of, for example, vascular <clears throat> surgery, this movement is different from this movement. And uh, yes, of course. And, and then uh, we all learn from each other. So it's not just phlebology. That would be my conclusion. It's not just doing yes. these. It's a practical problem. So. It's time to call on uh, one of the giants uh, who are with us today, Professor Eduardo Ramachotti from Sao Paulo. Eduardo. Hey, Professor Eman, how are you, guests? Well, it is my pleasure to be among friends. And Professor Eman gave me a very hostile topic to talk about is thrombophilia for vascular surgeons. People tend to think it's boring. So I'll try to make it interesting for vascular and for young vascular surgeons. Should I share my presentation, Professor? Okay, so I have 15 minutes to talk to you guys about thrombophilia and the vascular surgeon's perspective. These are not my disclosures. I have been working with so many companies, but for this particular presentation, no conflict of interest. So to define thrombophilia, Professor Imad, thrombophilia is tendency to have thrombosis either arterial or venous, it can be acquired, it can be hereditary. And we now know that for venous thrombosis, thrombophilia and genetic factors do play a major role in the pathogenesis. But for arterial thrombosis, we know that acquired conditions are encountered, but we do not know the genetic uh, factors influence on arterial thrombosis. 
And finally, pregnancy and thrombophilia is very important for vascular medicine. I'm quite sure that gynecologists will come to you with the thrombophilia tests and ask for advice. So we're going to focus on these three things, venous arterial thrombosis in pregnancy. We all know the three are the Rehoff, venous stasis, endothelial damage in a hypercoagulable state. And this is where thrombophilia generates thrombosis by increasing the hypercoagulable state. And hypercoagulability does not work only due to thrombophilia, but it can happen in surgery, in cancer, in estrogen, and also with the genetic disorders such as protein C, protein S, antithrombin 3 deficiency, factor 5 light and factor 2. And we also have some acquired disorders of coagulation that increases hypercoagulability such as nephrotic syndrome and probably the most important thing we're going to talk today, the antiphospholipid antibodies. So bear in mind, hypercoagulability happens not just because of thrombophilia, that's why we do not need so many tests. So for inherited uh, or genetic risk factors, these are the most important, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C and protein S deficiency, factor 5 light and mutation, the mutation of prothrombin, the factor 2, dysfibrinogenemias, and we have acquired risk factors such as age, immobilization, major surgery, cancer, antiphospholipid syndrome, APS, so it is acquired, it is not genetic, myeloproliferative disorders, HIT, prolonged their travel, and so on. So bear in mind that despite the fact that APS is considered thrombophilia, it is acquired, it, don't, it is not a genetic situation. This is important to talk to, to young folks. And we have some mixed situation that we don't know if it is genetic or acquired, such as hyperhomocysteinemia, high levels of factor 8, factor 9, and factor 11, and protein C resistance in the absence of the mutation of the factor 5 lidocaine. We don't know if it is genetic or it is acquired. So we have a mix of things, both on hypercoagulability and both on risk factors. So, Professor Emat, people tend to be afraid of the coagulation cascade. I have a very simple version. I call it the Ramachari version. It's not published yet. It is for educational purpose, but everything starts with tissue factor, cleavage of factor 7A, then TFPI factor 10 on top of fibroblasts, and then we clivate the factor 10 to 10A, 10A in the presence of factor 5, clivates 2 to 2A, and this is totally normal. This happens when I shave in the morning. But if it's not self-controlled, then we have issues. So the amplification goes to factor 8, factor 5, factor 11 that clivates on top of the platelets, the factor 8 to factor 11. And here we have an amplification of the conversion to 10 to 10A. And now, one molecule of tissue factor generated a thousand molecules of fibrin here, and we have thrombosis. This is a very simple version of the coagulation cascade. I did not divide it into intrinsic and extrinsic. It's a single pathway, very simple to explain to students. And we have the EPCR system that self-controls it by protein C and protein S blocking both factor 8 and factor 5. And we also have the self-regulatory system of antithrombin 3 that blocks four factors, and this is where heparin acts. This is a very simple coagulation cascade. So when we're talking about thrombophilia, here's the thing. Factor 5 mutated does not receive inhibition from factor B, protein C and protein S. Factor 2 mutated does not have self-regulation, and it has an increased ability to convert uh, uh, factor 13 to 13A. If we do not have antithrombin, we do not block four coagulation factors. If we do not have protein C, we don't have the self-regulation of factor 8 and factor 5. The same thing for protein S. And if we have super high concentration of factor 8, factor 11, 
and fibrinogen, we also have a thrombophilic state. So this is a very fast approach on the coagulation cascade and why thrombophilia plays a major role. It is quite simple as a matter of fact. Imagine the coagulation cascade and imagine both super concentrations of this factor or lack of inhibition of some factors and we have increased formation of thrombosis. So this is making uh, thrombophilia a long story short. So for venous thromboembolism, if you have antithrombin deficiency, you increase the risk by 10 times of have thromb uh, thrombosis. And this goes on for each of them. We have all everything mapped out. And the most important by far is antiphospholipid syndrome, the lupus anticoagulant and plus other two. They're quite important for the vascular surgeons. So we know that having thrombophilia increases your risk of having venous thrombo thrombosis. And to give an example, if we use a relative risk of one for a normal girl, if she takes contraceptive, it increases four times the risk of thrombosis, but it's still very low per year. But if this patient has factor five Leiden, seven times the risk, but very low. But if we combine oral contraceptives with factor five Leiden, then 35 times the risk of thrombosis. That's why some vascular surgeons do order the thrombophilia test for their daughters, which doesn't make much sense. And of course, if you have factor V homozygosis, I never saw one alive to reach uh, adulthood, but it's very high risk as well. So see, having factor V Leiden increases your risk of thromboembolism seven times, but it's very low numbers of factor V Leiden thrombotic patients per year. Okay. I have tested in the past if this mutations plays a role in cancer. This was actually my PhD 25 years ago, and we saw absolutely no correlation between factor V Leiden or all other mutations and thrombosis in cancer patients, meaning cancer is so prothrombotic that it's useless to test thrombophilia in these patients. Antiphospholipid syndrome diagnosis is done by clinical criteria, different and strange arterial and venous thrombosis. We need to use the laboratorial criteria, IgM or IgD, for uh, lupus anti uh, for uh, anticardiolipine or beta-2 glycoprotein, or the presence of lupus anticoagulant by functional test. So the three of them consi uh, consist of the triple positive, which is the super antiphospholipid syndrome, but just one of them repeated after four weeks, and you have the diagnosis of acquired antiphospholipid syndrome. And how do we treat that? Well, if you have a DVT with APS, then the anticoagulation is vitamin K with a higher INR. Long-term, meaning forever, because if you withdraw anticoagulation, the risk of recurrence is very high. And women with fatal loss and antiphospholipid syndrome needs to receive heparin full dose, low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. This is quite well known, so antiphospholipid syndrome, pay attention to that. From the guidelines now, we have it very well established. Antiphospholipid syndrome, the treatment is with vitamin K. But bear in mind, other mutations such as factor V lidin, factor II, or even protein C and protein S, for the first episode, doesn't change guidelines, meaning we don't pay much attention to thrombophilia. For arterial side, we know that it works for VTE, but we don't have much information on thrombotic events. And out of all of them tested for the arterial side, the only one that played a role in myocardial infarction and stroke was antiphospholipid syndrome. So thrombophilia screening for unselected patients population with myocardial infarction ischemic strokes or arterial thrombosis of the legs is basically not justified. Well, a good information we have on thrombophilia and arterial side is the factor 11. And this is the basis of development of factor 11 inhibition. Making a long story short, we know that thrombophilia or hemophilia type C is very well tolerated and patients with elevated factor 11 has a five times risk of stroke and uh, transient ischemic attack. That's why we're working with a factor 11A inhibition for this particular population. So making a long story short, thrombophilia and arterial thrombosis 
all the information we have is with antiphospholipid syndrome. So should we test all patients? What is the pro? We understand better the pathology. We can counsel family members. Imagine you detect a factor V Leiden in a mom that has a 15-year-old lady, and, but it's expensive. Many times it leads to over-aggressive management of thrombosis. We have insurance implications. It is very expensive. So we trend not to test much thrombophilia, and that's it. I know that many people are tempted to order these tests, but they don't have help as much. So if you decide to do the thrombophilia tests for strongly thrombophilic patients, Professor Eman, if you want to take a picture, that is the test you need to order. Genetic testing for factor five, genetic testing for factor two, functional assays for antithrombin protein, C protein S, clotting test for lupus anticoagulant and ELISA for cardiolipin and beta 2 glycoproteins, total plasma homocysteine, uh, serum concentrations of factor eight, factor nine, and factor 11, and plasma levels of fibrinogen. This is where we, we this is our the test we trend to order for thrombophilia. Uh, tests. Very important paper from our friend Saskia Middeldorf last year. She showed that for pregnant women with all these mutations, forget APS, APS we give anticoagulation, antiphospholipid we give, but factor 5 Leiden, factor 2, protein C, protein S, heparin does not protect from fetal losses. So imagine, uh, here in Brazil, it's very common in the US, it is very common, women with recurrent fetal loss receiving low molecular weight heparin. This Lancet paper last year showed there is no higher live birth rates with low molecular weight heparin. So Saskia Middeldorf and her team says that we do, should not give low molecular weight heparin for fetal losses, and they advise against thrombophilia tests in women. So when to test according to the guidelines? Strange VTEs associated with non-surgical or hormonal risk factors, very strange DVTs on cerebral or splanchnic sites, strong family histories, pregnant women with history of thrombophilia and cancer plus family history of DVT. So it's very, very restrict indication from thrombophilia tests. This is last year published by the ASH, American Society of Hematology Guidelines on who should we test. And what do we do with these patients? For the right risk, you have a DVT, two or more spontaneous event, one life threatening such as splanchnic or cerebral, one spontaneous event with antiphospholipid syndrome, you give indefinite anticoagulation. For the other uh, thrombophilia, treat as everybody you treat. So imagine I'm treating a DVT on Professor Imad, and he has factor five mutation. I'm going to treat him for one year and a half period, and I'll give him full anticoagulation forever if we have a second episode. But the presence of factor five or factor two won't change my strategy to treat him. So in summary, Professor Imad, to making a long story short, Thrombophilia is a tendency to thrombosis. It is well documented on VTE, but less documented on the arterial side. Ordering these tests doesn't change much what we clinically do unless we are suspecting of antiphospholipid syndrome. And young folks, do not test your patients unless you have real good reasons to think about thrombophilia. And I finished my presentation with Mr. Edwards Deming saying, Without data, you are just another person with an opinion. We have so many people with opinion, but with no solid data to give us. So for everything, we decide we need solid data. This is my presentation, Professor Emma. I'll be happy to take questions, whatever you want me to do so. Thank you so much, Professor Machotti, uh, uh, Eduardo. Uh, Another, yet another masterly lecture from your part, which I'm used to. However, I would like uh, to invite uh, one of our um, discussants, uh, uh, Professor Abdurrahman Salim first, then uh, Professor Hanan Hamid afterwards. 
uh, with a short comment. Uh, Professor Abdurrahman, are you there? I'm with you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me for this uh, yes, nice please, congress. Uh, what do you propose uh, as perioperative, diagnostic, or prophylactic measures to be taken in a young lady who is about to be operated by us uh, and all our uh, our interventions um, carry the risk carry the risk already of uh, inviting a thrombotic uh, sort of a thrombotic tendency but I'm talking about a 35 years old lady who is about to be having an intervention in the vascular surgery department with uh, a prior attack of thrombosis and uh, no family history and no other well-known risk factors, so sort of unprovoked. What do you think should be done from our side in the vascular department, different yeah. from what we do right now? Uh, this is a really a deep question, Dr. Ahmed, and um, uh, I take the opportunity to, uh, to know the answer from uh, our lecturer professor before I tell my opinion, because uh, this is a really, really deep question for unprovoked DVT, especially if it's uh, once attack. Uh, if it is multiple attacks, all of us know that we will go for uh, thrombophilia profile and according to the prof thrombophilia profile we will deal with. But for a single unprovoked attack, uh, really, uh, uh, I, I need to, uh, to hear the answer from our uh, professor uh, to know to know what's the the, the protocol he, he recommend for us professor eduardo could you uh, reply for yeah, sure i, I try to keep it simple Iman. you know yeah, why do we have the caprini score for this situation calculate the caprini score for her do not order thrombophilia because it won't change and if she's super high risk, you're going to give her 30 days of prophylaxis with either low molecular weight happening right now. We're learning how to use dogs. And it doesn't change much if you order thrombophilia uh, uh, tests or not. Because if you do the Caprini, it's a high Caprini. And you're concerned if her platelet counts is okay. She doesn't have history of bleeding. And her creatinine clearance is okay, then you do 30 days prophylaxis and that's it. Do not waste money from your government or for an insurance or for the patient for a test that won't change much. That well, is right. yeah. the professor, as you as you know, uh, NOAX has very limited uh, rule in um, antiphospholipid. So so if we, we if we ignored or we missed the antiphospholipid, we 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 might um, miss uh, th th this is my my uh, my, my, my question. If, if she has antiphospholipid, should be uh, should be receiving low molecular weight or or uh, even warfarin with limited yeah. effect of NOAX. So I think we need to put things in context here. So the question was for a patient who had a thrombotic event, and then uh, we're concerned. Unprovoked. 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 Yeah, yes. she had an unprovoked, and she will undergo surgery with Professor Imad in Egypt. So he does the the the. the the Caprini score, and he decides to do 30 days prophylaxis with whatever he wants, but he chooses low molecular weight heparin because it is the guideline in Egypt. This is a situation that we don't know she has antiphospholipid syndrome. If the same lady now has a DVT and she has antiphospholipid syndrome, by guidelines and by clinical experience, we need to treat her with vitamin K antagonists with a higher INR of 3 to 3.5 plus aspirin. And people might say, well, we have a paper from somewhere that showed increased recurrence of arterial thrombosis with DOAX. It's because DOAX doesn't work for APS, which is not true. The thing is the dose we tested for VT treatment of DOAs were improper for APS. So at this point, I agree with you, Professor Salen, we should treat with vitamin K antagonists, but we are currently running a trial where we are, I'm not part of this trial as a matter of fact, but we are checking the possibility of treating APS with 15 BID rivaroxaban, which is a super dose of DOAs. We don't have this data yet, 
But as of now, if this patient has a DVT, she needs to receive vitamin K antagonists. For prophylaxis, we don't know if she has uh, 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 APS or not because we didn't test. However, if we know that she has APS, then the prophylaxis should be aggressive with low molecular weight heparin. Now, let me, let me, uh, excuse me to interrupt, but let me, uh, I think it's timely to intervene and uh, I have a question and I will uh, drag, uh, I'll take the, the, the this um, lead from uh, Professor Robert Shoti and then uh, I want to address a question to uh, Professor Hanan Hamid uh, related to the issue we are talking about. Professor yes. Hanan. Uh, first, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good night for Brazil. Uh, thank you, Professor Machetti. Actually, uh, you made my mission very easy. Uh, I'm a hematologist. I don't have the honor to be surgeon. Um, I actually, have a burning uh, question, uh, Professor Hanan. Uh, yes. Do I have the sense that uh, anticoagulation is to be revisited? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I will I will pass by, by by that in in few slides at the end of my presentation, uh, but uh, in the issue of antiphospholipid syndrome, we do have documented uh, studies. The last of them have been published in 2022 that uh, 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 vitamin K antagonist, I mean warfarin, is superior to uh, most of the drugs and it gives less incidence, particularly of cerebrovascular events. So we are still now. Uh, uh, maintaining the use of vitamin K agonist for cases of antiphospholipid syndrome. But we don't use that on suspeculation suspic or uh, something like medical sense. We have to have a document. We have to have a lab test which document that this patient is having antiphospholipid syndrome. And we depend on three tests, Professor uh, Ramachuti just mentioned, and uh, we have to have at least... Uh, uh, one or two of them positive to be repeated after at least four weeks, and they are positive as well. Uh, actually, in my hands, I'm still using uh, vitamin K antagonist. Uh, there are some studies running for the use of the wax, higher dose, as he mentioned, but still we are awaiting for the results. Uh, I have a comment on the, the wonderful presentation of Professor Machetti. Uh, we are in hematology field. We should look into something else in a young patient uh, with uh, unprovoked uh, venous thromboembolism. This could be something hematological. This could be something systemic, like, for instance, renal disease with loss of antithrombin 3 in nephrotic cases. I have a... a, a tens, hundreds of cases, uh, for the first time of them, they are having uh, either a massive venous thromboembolism or a critical uh, uh, arterial uh, thrombosis, secondary to hematological disease. I have a patient 18 years old with aggressive butt carry syndrome, didn't respond to anything and was planned for life donor liver transplant. I'm, I'm the hematology team of transplantation in our uh, institute. And the refer the patient for me what to do as a prophylaxis uh, prior and post uh, transplantation with factor V Leiden heterogeneous uh, tyrosiacus mutation. And in my experience, this is not the proper or the common cause of uh, 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 butt syndrome, isolated heterozygous mutation of factor V Leiden. So I start dig deeper in this patient, and this patient proved to be uh, sorry, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria as a cause of this butt carry syndrome. So we have to look globally on the patient because we might find something else which is systemic or hematological, which is the cause of the condition. And I assure you that arterial thrombosis is there in thrombophilia, either congenital, but more acquired, and particularly in the field of hematology with many diseases like PMH, myeloproliferative neoplasms, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and hit. I used to see many, many cases with different typical arterial thrombosis in those patients. Professor Hanan, yes. uh, we are uh, all ears and looking forward to your lecture, which will further enlighten all of us, uh, especially that we are having uh, uh, online 38 uh, plus participants, and I'm sure uh, it will be uh, generating lots of uh, comments, uh, both you. by the experts in the panel and... Um, yeah and the uh, participants online as well. So uh, if your uh, presentation is ready, we are uh, looking forward to hearing it. Then I will yeah. invite Professor Sharif Hassan to uh, wrap it up uh, uh, afterwards. 
as uh, as we go by. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, my, my presentation will be today on reality, hands on, on cases, and nothing teach us better than patients. Uh, this, uh, I'm going to go through three scenarios, one of them of a congenital background, the second on a scenario on a case with acquired condition, and the third case is a melange of both. Uh, I have nothing to declare, uh, and this slide has been beautifully shown by Professor uh, Ramachuti before is the uh, cow triad, which is still applicable for us, either for circulatory stasis, endothelial injury, or hypercoagulable state. I want just to add having single risk is less dangerous than having double of them. And when the three are together, we are on a critical situation. And I will again uh, uh, emphasize that inherited and acquired disorders can lead to thrombophilia and I assure you that in spite of venous thromboembolism is the most frequently encountered cases, but in hematology field, I have seen plenty of arterial conditions uh, uh, or arterial thrombosis in uh, thrombophilia. Congenital and acquired cases uh, or causes have been beautifully uh, uh, discussed by Professor uh, Ramachuti. And now I'm, I will start with the first scenario. My patient is a female lady, 30, 30 years, uh, 38 years old, having four kids younger three years after delivery of the last baby of hers she started to take uh, uh, oral contraceptive pills she had no previous history of any medical abnormality she got respiratory tract infection severe respiratory tract infection according to her a couple of uh, weeks prior to the presentation and when she presented to us she said that few days ago, she had abdominal pain, which is escalating in severity. And then she developed an attack of hematemesis, which brought her to our emergency department. The endoscopy was full of blood. The stomach was full of blood. The patient was severely anemic. Platelets and leukocyte counts were normal. ESR was slightly elevated. Then immediately next day, she had a picture of peritonitis, urgent re-imaging uh, uh, her with abdominal ultrasonography showed this thickened uh, 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 small bowel wall and some sort what somewhat the, the, the uh, radiologist called uh, bright flakes inside the wall. And uh, we proceed immediately for uh, uh, angiography for the abdominal vessels, and this confirms the presence of mesenteric vascular occlusion. This patient was immediately transferred for surgical intervention. The operative data showed extensive gangrenous part of intestine after the fourth part of the duodenum up to about two or one and a half meters from the ileocecal junction. Resection of the dead intestine with anastomosis was done. And this was a very unusual situation. So we start to, to ask the legitimate questions, why this had happened and what to do in such condition. Look at this uh, 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 genetic or thrombophilia screening. The patient is having positive heterogeneous or heterozygous factor V Leiden mutation. What we do in the panel in Egypt, we do as well factor V R2, which is replacement of uh, uh, amino acid at the position 1299 one, 1, by another amino acid. There was a heterozygous mutation of factor V Leiden. The other, G, the other uh, 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 gene was uh, uh, mutated by R2. Now, do we have, the question is, do we have other phenotypes of mutation of factor V? And does this mutation or do this, this mutation have impact on the liability thrombophilia in those patients? So this is the big question. Now, do we have papers confirming that or denying that? I start to dig into the uh, uh, references, and I found that many papers speaking about different phenotypes of factor V mutation, especially factor V HR2, and this factor was questioned. Do we have potentiation of factor V Leiden mutation, if we have another uh, gene with R2 mutation, or could it alone make an initiation of a thrombotic tendency? And I found a couple of papers confirming that R2 could potentiate the thrombotic liability with factor V Leiden mutation, and it by itself could initiate a thrombotic episode. So 
Do we have another document for that? Yes, you can see clearly that people who have never had factor V mutation in their screening are having this life expectancy or kaplan meier uh, survival uh, put, uh, potential. And those who are having factor V Leiden as a heterozygous alone, this is the survival expectancy with them. But when we have combined factor V Leiden and R2 mutation, the situation is worse. So we are having something else in the factor V mutation, another phenotype of the mutation in combination with factor V Leiden as a heterozygous could worsen the situation. And it, if it is present alone in the shadow of something else, either a, 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 a triggering factor for thrombosis or something, some systemic disease, other disease which might lead to thrombosis or with advancement of age, we could have a thrombotic event due to this, this other uh, uh, phenotype of factor V Leiden. Of factor five other than light. I will come to my second scenario. She is, or she was at that time at 2006, 41 years old, known to have nothing at all. She complained of indigestion, abdominal pain, discomfort over a few weeks prior to presentation to us. Actually, she was referred to me from one of my colleagues in other department as if, as she is potentially a lymphoma patient because she has had an ultrasonography confirming the presence of enlarged liver and spleen with asymmetrical hepatic echogenicity. And this was the uh, sonography of hers. You can see that this is not a typical uh, 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 infiltrative lesion. It looks more like a mottling of the liver and even a mottling of the spleen. So I thought of vascular condition in this patient rather than being an infiltration by lymphoma. This is the CT of the patient. The same is applicable for the CT cuts. We are having this uh, uh, diffuse infiltration in the liver and spleen, and the liver and spleen are quite enlarged. By doing uh, uh, angiography, this patient should to have blood carry syndrome. Again, a normal, healthy, 41 years old lady who is not on contraceptive pills, she is not treated by any uh, uh, hormonal therapy, and she is not having any precipitating factor for, known precipitating factor for a uh, thrombotic event. What should be the uh, strategy for, treat, for managing this, for investigating this patient? First of all, the patient has had elevated liver enzymes, elevated bilirubin, and elevated prothrombin type. Renal function, other metabolic profile was normal. Immunological study, including anti-nuclear DNA, anti-cardiolipin, lupus, anticoagulant, and even antineutrophilic cytoplasm anti uh, antibodies, all of them were negative, while the CBC of hers was striking by the platelets of 2 million uh, uh, or uh, 2 million, slightly below 2 million, 1 million and 3 quarters. So this patient is having severe thrombocytosis. Then we proceeded for bone marrow examination. And the bone marrow examination confirmed the presence of essential thrombocytosis, which is one of the disease or a group of diseases in hematology known as myeloproliferative neoplasms. Those patients with essential thrombocytemia could proceed or polycythemia vera could proceed to myelofibrosis and could proceed or through myelofibrosis or directly to acute leukemia. So the situation is critical. And I, I, at that time, I was in need of another confirmatory test. And I met for her molecular study, which confirmed the presence of the JAK2 mutation. And this confirms the occurrence of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Now, the, the patient was kept on anticoagulation plus cytoreductive therapy. And she was running a peaceful course for less than a year. Another surprise with this patient came after almost one year when she felt slight hemiparesis and a disturbed equilibrium. Her husband phoned me and I said, take her to the hospital, I'm coming to you immediately. We started by MRI brain, which showed the, the, the picture we, should, we showed before, this tiny uh, infarcted area, and we did for her uh, uh, carotid duplex. And for our, uh, uh, I'm not going to say astonishment, I will say our shock, this is the common carotid artery. This is the start of the internal carotid artery. The patient is having this 
black, ugly, giant thrombus at the beginning of the bifurcation of the common right common carotid artery into the internal carotid artery, blocking the majority of the stream of the internal carotid artery. And this is another picture with a common carotid artery, internal carotid, and this is the external carotid, and this is the left external carotid artery with no, nothing at all. This is the angio, the picture of the angio. These arrows are uh, pointing to this uh, uh, thrombus obstructing more than 50% of the uh, 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 start of the internal carotid artery. Now this patient is anticoagulated. She is a myeloproliferative disorder, and we have to intervene. What to do for this patient to prevent more embolization from this thrombus to the brain? And if we are going to go, go mechanically, uh, we are afraid that this patient might have dislocation of part of this thrombus to the brain, and this could result into a massive neurological damage. After multidisciplinary discussion, we, we, we sit together, hematologist, vascular surgeon, uh, imaging and neurointerventional and neurological uh, specialist. And they dis we decided at the end of the day with, with discussing all the possibilities to, to rescue this patient, we, dis we decided to put a spider distal to the uh, uh, neuroprotective uh, filter distal to the thrombus and from below, we will try to do suction thrombectomy for this patient. And we did aspiration of the neuro intervention, did aspiration. This is the spider neuroprotector, and this is the tip of the catheter uh, to suck or to withdraw the thrombus through the other side, the other femoral artery, using uh, 8F uh, match uh, uh, guiding catheter from the second femoral approach. And this is the final situation with total removing the, the uh, thrombus uh, through the uh, 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 thrombectomy uh, and the patient was left with no uh, uh, neurological deficit. Uh, she got very mild bilateral puncture hematoma. We secured by prolonged compression and we transferred for her fresh frozen plasma to help prevention of more so, uh, leading in this anticoagulated patient. We shifted to low molecular weight heparin. Uh, we kept her in the ICU for a couple of days to assure that there is no bleeding and the patient had been uh, uh, discharged uh, on anticoagulation and cytoreductive therapy. The patient survived till 2019 when she got her first acute leukemia uh, uh, transformation. Then she took her treatment and we start to uh, uh, prepare her for uh, uh, bone marrow transplantation. Unfortunately, we didn't find a matched donor from her family, and we tried to look for a matched unrelated donor. Then a year later, before we got a matched really unrelated donor, the patient went to went into second acute leukemia uh, uh, exacerbation, and unfortunately, she passed away. By the way, in the middle of that, we have had an abdominal duplex showed portal vein thrombosis in the process with cavernous uh, transformation and the hepatic veins were totally uh, uh, recanalized. So in this patient with myeloproliferative disorder, we have seen a very common uh, thrombosis in those patients, which is blankening vein thrombosis. When I have a patient with abdominal pain with a hematological disorder, I go immediately or abdominal duplex, or even angio, to confirm that we do not have a mesenteric vascular occlusion or a butt Chiari syndrome or a portal vein thrombosis or something like that. And when we have something like that, I start immediately anticoagulation, bearing in mind to avoid vitamin K antagonists as much as I can, because if the patient bleeds, I need to give him only something short acting. So I start by low molecular weight heparin if I need it, or I go for one of the DOACs uh, if uh, the condition permits. My third scenario, when misfortunes do not come single. Yes, I, my patient was 22 years old, again with pain, swelling, uh, right lower limb. Her mother gave history. She is the only child of her mother, and her mother gave history of DVT postpartum. She has had only tachycardia manifestation of DVT on the right side. This is the uh, duplex of her uh, with occlusion of the right 
common uh, femoral and uh, internal iliac uh, uh, vein. And uh, the patient have had uh, an ac uh, accentuated uh, pulmonary uh, sound on the cardiac examination. This is the echocardiography of this patient. She has had an intracardiac thrombi. It's not only a, a, a DVT on the light, right lower limb, il the iliac veins. She has had multiple thrombi intracardiac. And this patient, her investigation showed her to be heterozygous mutant of factor V Leiden, heterozygous mutant of the thrombin 2210A uh, uh, mutation, and anticardiolipin positive, lupus anticoagulant positive, and elevated ESR. This patient has combined factor V and thrombin heterozygous mutation and antiphospholipid antibody. So what we do in such condition, should we give this patient a, a, a thrombolytic uh, uh, treatment. Of course, it is contraindicated because the patient is having multiple cardiac thrombi. This might fragment and go everywhere in the body. So we kept her on anticoagulation and I'm following her up for more than 12 years now. She's having a son. He's six years old now and she has been advised uh, not to conceive again and I hope that she will follow the instruction. Just a few words about anticoagulation with antiphospholipid is one of the major indications for warfarin beside mechanical heart valve. And these are the different uh, studies which confirm antiphospholipid uh, for uh, treatment in uh, vitamin K antagonist for treatment of antiphospholipid. I just want to tell you something uh, which Professor Ramachuchi uh, just alluded to it, that factor 11 uh, which are the contact, one of the contact factors, be, because we, we kept for, for a decade or more very much interesting about tissue factor pathway, but it seems that we are going to uh, direct our face to the contact factor and the hematologists start to have a new model coagulation that uh, they consider that the uh, tissue factor pathway will lead to physiological hemostasis while contact factor pathway will lead to thrombus inside the body of the blood vessel leading to pathological thrombosis. And that's why we are trying to uncouple the pathway of maintaining homostasis from the pathway of thrombosis. And that's why a new, this new model have led to the possibility of use of factor 11 inhibition as an anticoagulation, which will give us two targets. It will decrease the bleeding complication and it will reduce the thrombosis. And it confirmed that the targeting of factor 11 is the safest ever zone of bleeding complications, which could be achieved through many mechanisms. And we have now plenty of drugs. Some of them are in the phase three and having uh, a very fast access to be approved. And one of the uh, wonders of this, that we have some antibodies which could be given as anticoagulant once monthly or some antisense oligonucleotide, which could be given once weekly as an anticoagulation. And the promise of contact pathway inhibitor, which is mainly inhibition of factor 11, is attenuation of thrombosis without disruption of hemostasis or bleeding tendency. And I think very soon we will have factor 11 and factor 12 inhibition in the markets. And be, with all of these good surprises, I will come to the end of my presentation that bleeding remain a concern in anticoagulation, inhibition of factor 11, and uncoupling thrombosis from hemostasis is providing us a safer anticoagulation, and we will have many trials which will lead to fast-track FDA approval of new anticoagulant. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, and very well uh, to hear any comments from your side. Thank you, Professor Hanan, for the uh, brilliant update uh, on the way to go, especially in the future models of anticoagulation in such challenging situations. Professor Eduardo, uh, could you give us a final comment uh, before you leave? Uh, sure. It is a pleasure to talk with hematologists and Professor uh, 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 Professor Hanan was a very nice surprise. See, we have so many good colleagues everywhere in the world. Professor Hanan, uh, I used to share your optimism towards factor 11, and I still think it's going to play a role, but it won't be a major role in venous thrombosis and atrial fibrillation. The last yes, year. I agree. Yeah, I agree 100% with you. I agree 100% with you. I think the, the future might be uh, uh, to 
combined factor 11 with a smaller dose of other anticoagulation. I think uh -huh. this will be the future trials after we, we having approval to get benefit of two points. Number one, of long-acting anticoagulation to be given once weekly, once every more than a week, and to potentiate the action of other anticoagulation without the higher risk of bleeding tendency. And the, no study up till now is, is performed on that concept, but I think this will be the path we will go very soon in this condition. Well, I'm very involved in the global trials for factor 11, and I can tell you that we interrupted the age of fibrillation with the bio compound basically yes. for lack of efficacy uh, yeah. it, it, bad yeah. but we're learning how to deal with the factor 11 inhibition and you're correct maybe the future will be a combination of and we will need a fine tuning in the trials profession and professor, even combination I, with with uh, with antiplatelets particularly for coronary heart disease or for the cerebral uh, arterial event uh, i anticipate that if i'm alive Till this will happen, uh, I think we will see that coming very soon. Yeah, that's it, Professor Helen. It was very nice interacting and getting to know you. Professor Emma always are introducing me to really interesting people. And I, I, it's unfortunate, but according to my agenda, I, I was supposed to stay at just 9 a.m. here at my time. I have another call now, Professor. So I, I need to say goodbye to all my friends, Professor Antignani. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. My new friend, Professor Hanna, it was a pleasure to be with you guys, Professor Sharif. And next time, well, I want to do it face to face, going to where Alexandria uh, Library looking, was. Looking built. forward. Thank you so much, Professor Eduardo. It will be my uh, honor and pleasure. Day. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Have a great bye. Sunday for bye. you all. Bye, Professor bye. Sharif. Bye bye. We cannot. Um, let Professor Hanan Hamid uh, go away without um, dragging her into our local needs. Now, uh, there are the two of us, at least uh, at this moment, your kind self and me, uh, vascular surgeons, and there's Professor Hanan Hamid on the other hand. The just I want to, uh, in 10 seconds, uh, uh, recall uh, a bit of history. Maybe you have witnessed that some uh, 20 years ago or even more, I was so serious to apply for a post in our department for a clinical hematologist, which happened to be a brilliant young lady at the time called uh, Professor Hanan Hamid. But it didn't work. Do you share with me uh, that this should be uh, uh, retried again? With the, with the faculty and, uh, and administration. Um, That's question mm -hmm. number one. Number two, uh, uh, do you think, um, to wrap it up, uh, that there are steps like one, two, three, which would lead us towards a safer uh, vascular surgery with a simple protocol that Professor Hanan Hamid would help us in? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> practicing uh, uh, philobology or angiology is a teamwork. Uh, it's not a single speciality uh, business. Uh, I think we have to have decisions in not only in, in management, or, but also in diagnosing patient properly uh, from uh, definitely laboratory medicine, from imaging, from vascular surgeon, from hematologists, and even sometimes from interns as well. Actually, uh, the true burden the true burden comes mm. on our uh, on our shoulders as vascular surgeons. Uh, and I wish to have the input of uh, Professor Sharif uh, at this particular moment, because we have to deal with both arterial and venous thrombotic yeah. situations, and then follow up the patient properly. What do you think, Professor Sharif? Well, yes. Well, yes. It's it's as Professor Hanan Hamid said. It's a, it should be a multidisciplinary uh, approach or team uh, everywhere because uh, most of our patients, um, I mean, uh, we come we face a lot of uh, cases joined between us and the hematology and the immunology and rheumatology. So yeah. uh, there should be there should be really a, a multidisciplinary team approach for such cases because in a, on a lot of occasions I can I, I face a patient with uh, 
some sort of a, a hematological problem or a vasculatory problem that comes to me. And then I try to explain to her that her the solution for her problem is not solely with me as a vascular surgeon, but she has to be between myself and the hematologist or between myself and the immunologist. So this is yeah. one thing. The other thing, the other point that I want to ask uh, Professor Hannah had for in her uh, lovely presentation, uh, I, I, I think that the second case scenario where this lady who went into the to the hospital with just abdominal pain, and then it turned out to be a, a, a myeloproliferative disorder resulting in a venous thrombosis. Yeah, exactly. In mesenteric vascular occlusion. So, if now uh, uh, if we come to see take a single hospital for an example, each day probably there is uh, maybe from between 100 and 200 and 300 cases that comes presenting to the ER with abdominal pain. So how can Some we of them are missed. select? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. exactly. So we are, I think we are really in need for a quick uh, um, blood test, blood test to, to be, to, to direct us. Do you think, I think that the D dimer is not uh, good because if a uh, patient has an inflammatory bowel disorder, for example, or appendicitis, for example, or cholecystitis, she yeah. she still will have her D-dimer elevated. So we are really lacking a laboratory test to diagnose uh, the thrombotic event uh, in such cases, or otherwise we'll be ending up with doing uh, such uh, hematological tests for 100 or 200 patients per day in each single hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I can't agree more. And uh, I think um, uh, early prior to any uh, surgical intervention in abdominal pain, uh, you, we, we have to have, as I said, multidisciplinary because the key of the diagnosis could be a patient without history and the splenomegaly, for instance, with a CBC uh, pointing to something. So I think CBC with a film are very important from a hematological point of view. Clinical signs and symptoms are very important, and we mostly pick most of those cases just from the symptomatology, the proper CBC, the very very good examination, uh, and we can find signs and symptoms which could lead us to ask the proper investigation we need for this patient, and accordingly we will properly diagnose the patient, and even not to let you uh, uh, to open a patient or to uh, to uh, operate upon a patient who is highly risky if you operate upon him, because uh, if you open a patient who is having abdominal pain and he is, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, a portal vein thrombosis or something else without gangrene does not need surgery, and he is uh, severely thrombophilic. Uh, the sequences could be very disastrous for the patient. So we have uh, we have to to diagnose the patient properly from the start. I think so. Uh, so Ahmed, you you protocol. Yeah. yeah. Can we have a very simplified protocol, uh, which is guiding us in the vascular surgery department? <clears throat> For this particular scenario, which is not uncommon, mentioned by Professor Sharif, <clears throat> is there a, a simplified protocol for this, or we are still far from being there, Professor Hane? Uh, I, I don't think, up till now, we don't have guidelines to go with pro proper protocol, protocol. It depends on um, uh, how to how to properly pick up your patient if this patient is antiphospholipid, if you're, this patient is a case of hematological disorder. Sometimes cases with something like PNH, you, you cannot diagnose them except with a proper CBC and uh, a, a reticulocytic count, and you do Coombs test and they find the patient is Coombs negative, and you, you start to put the puzzles together to see the whole picture of the patient. Uh, it's not an easy process. You do not have a unified protocol or a unified algorithm to go through. Each patient is a case by himself or herself, and you have to make your mind to utilize all the signs and symptoms and simple tests to go further for the proper time. So as we are doing right now, please correct me if we are wrong. Uh, supposedly, <clears throat> we face both Professor Sharif and myself a case with um, a, a new case with uh, untraditional uh, situation of a thrombotic uh, insult or multiple thrombotic insults, uh, that would probably uh, raise a flag for us, mm -hmm. red flag. And then we would go for uh, the full workup. Do you agree mm -hmm. with us or you have some other advice? Um, if you have a clinical 
manifestations, I mean symptoms or signs uh, pointing to something special group of diseases, as I said, like a hematological disease or rheumatological disease, will go after that. But as an internist and hematologist, the way I, I, <coughs> I programmed my brain to investigate a case of thrombosis through many channels, three of them are majors, and they are the three pillars. Number one, if I have a hematological background of this thrombotic event. Number two, if I have an immunological background of this thrombotic event. Number three, if I have a malignant background of this thrombotic event. And uh, to uh, our knowledge, we know that, and it is documented everywhere, that 10% of patients with unprovoked malignant, malignant uh, sorry, thrombotic episode will show malignancy within 10 years of this episode. And I have had many patients who have had presenting for the first time as a thrombotic event, typically in, in, a, in a limb or in a typical site, and they proved themselves to be uh, of hidden malignancy like breast cancer, like lymphoma, like uh, colorectal malignancy. I have seen plenty of patients, the first presentation of their malignancy is pulmonary thrombosis without peripheral uh, uh, venous thrombosis in the periphery. And I have seen many patients who had a typical site of presentation like brain sinus thrombosis or abdominal vein thrombosis. And after two years, three years, or even five years, they uh, showed the manifestation of malignancy. So these are the three pillars to think of while you are examining your patient. Is he like a patient of autoimmune something or a, a, a rheumatological something? Is he a patient looks like a hematological patient and a CBC with some abnormality, including the film, which is very important, or this patient could have a paramalignant or a first presentation as malignancy associating or prece preceding a malignant episode. These are the three most important places to go beside the congenital uh, uh, thrombophilia. I have a tiny proposition, and I, I would be very pleased to have your consent about that. And uh, also, Professor Sharif's, um, could we have uh, once monthly a joint Clinic. meeting in yeah. your presence? Uh, uh, the, the month monthly meeting uh, led, uh, if I may, by Professor Sharif and Sam, uh, yeah. to expose some of our cases, get you involved, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, probably look for uh, novel ways out of the box to enhance uh, our knowledge as vascular, my knowledge as vascular surgeon, uh, and uh, the rest of my colleagues in the department. Could yes. we have this sort of once monthly meeting under your uh, leadership, yes. Professor Sharif? Yes, yes, this is this will be great, and especially uh, they are they are not going to be too much cases. They will be very few uh, every week, every month. And uh, uh, we can go for how to do simple tests to diagnose. How about that monthly, once monthly meeting under your leadership, Professor Sharif, with, in presence of uh, Professor Hanan Hamid, and we're all with you. Yes. Uh, sure, that, that would be a great uh, opportunity, of course, to, to, to share difficult cases that uh, we face uh, every day. So, uh, and we might uh, we might invite the aromatologist with us. This will be of great asset for uh, for all of us. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. I think Professor Ahmad Hussain would be. Uh, you can do that. Uh, I mean, the invitation and all this uh, logistic work. Yeah, I think you are the best <laughs> professor to, actually, to do this. Actually, uh, the the issue is that um, the cases we are talking about are not encountered every day with us. They are encountered yeah. in, in, in tens or dozens uh, by Professor Hanan. But when we face each case, A, we have and we, we think that it might be a thrombophilic or uh, another pre-thrombotic uh, status uh, admitted in the vascular surgery department. A, we have very expensive uh, a full workup once we decide to have it. B, uh, it does not. It does not become reproducible in 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 the following case, which would come facing us after like a couple of months or three months. And it might be in Demerdash or it might be at Anshams University Specialized Hospital. So yeah. the lessons that are learned are fitting uh, some hindrances. 
that's what I'm talking about. Once we are having uh, this high index of suspicion and once we are having a, 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 a common language with the clinical hematology and the rheumatology as proposed by Professor Hanan, we might be in a different situation. Yeah. Probably. Yes. So uh, thank you again for your time and for your input, to Professor Hanan, Professor Sharif, and uh, all our uh, distinguished panels. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, future cooperation uh, within the same context, but in, in probably a different uh, challenging topic. Uh, this, yeah. um, this meeting has been and, and webinar have been uh, so productive and fruitful, hopefully. And uh, God bless you all. So looking forward to seeing you very near future.